Welcome, Mike. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Patrick and Jerry. It's a privilege to be here. Mike, you're here to talk, to talk about behavioral psychology and share how that's made an impact in your teams. Can we kick this off by immersing everybody joining us in an example to help us build some awareness around all the different dynamics you're going to introduce us to? Absolutely. And so we'll get into this, but today we'll talk a lot about how our minds work and different ways that we all make decisions. And I think to start, there's a classic uh, psychological experiment around selective attention. It's about one minute long. And we'd ask all of you to focus in and help participate in the mini exper experiment. So with that, I'm going to pull up a video. And uh, good luck. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? We'll pause it there. And the research shows that on that experiment, half of us don't see the gorilla. And on reflection, if you fell into that camp, once you then see the gorilla, uh, you can never, never forget. And what we can learn from experiments like this is really to understand how the mind actually works in practice, um, not how we think it works, and then to take that feedback into how we design our own organizations and how we design our interactions with other people. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. Great, I think that's a very good way to introduce the concept. Thanks, Mike. Um, how does, what's the magic be, behind the, the, the video? Uh, what's the trick and how is this relevant to managing engineering teams? So one of the, um, really kind of interesting principles that comes from behavioral psychology is this notion that we have two types of brains. We have a brain that reacts immediately to some kind of stimulus in the environment. And we have a brain that reacts more slowly, logically, analytically, analyzing the situation. Uh, there's a seminal book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel laureate in this field, uh, where he describes some of these learnings and walks through many, many experiments uh, that have been done in the field to understand how our brain works. Uh, but in this specific instance, the task is considered complex. Um, and even just thinking about that, how, a task as simple as counting passes is complex. And it requires our focus. Why our focus? Because we're differentiating between white and black. We're di differentiating between dribbling and passing. And it means that our mind is solely focused on the task at hand, which is counting. And when we deliver that intense focus on one area of interest, it turns out that the other areas we're not paying attention to. Those aren't happening. Um, what I find fascinating in kind of these kinds of experiments, particularly if you're in the camp that didn't see the gorilla, it's shocking. I can't believe I didn't see that even when this thing stops in the middle of the screen. It's so obvious that there was a gorilla, but that's the reality of what it means for us to focus our attention on one task. Once we understand that, we can kind of raise our own individual awareness around um, how we're uh, interacting, what we're thinking, how we're perceiving the information that's coming in uh, from our environments. Mike, you mentioned uh, in our early conversation, you mentioned a, a fascinating book called Thinking Fast and Slow and referencing the principles covered in that book and how you apply that successfully managing your, your team uh, and company. Do you have a few examples that you can, uh, that can show us um, how those principles are in play? Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the, for me personally, um, it was an inter interesting journey to, to really think about the things that we talk about as important in our companies and our, in our organizations, and then to observe kind of the outcomes that may be different or kind of our behavior that's a little bit different with 
the way we would describe our work. Um, and for me personally, um, once I was aware of this kind of fast and slow distinction in terms of how our minds work, um, just knowing that that distinction is there is in itself very, very powerful. And once um, I knew that, then I think it allowed for kind of certain um, changes in behavior. And some very simple things that I did initially for myself was sitting in a meeting, chatting, as Jerry and I are chatting now, uh, starting to actively listen to what uh, Jerry is saying, to what my friends and colleagues are saying in a conversation, and then just starting to label my reaction. Which of my brains responded to the question or the comment that was just made? Was that my fast brain or my slow brain? Um, and then once I could start labeling, then I could start ans asking the question, okay, that was my fast brain. Do I really want to make a decision here or a reaction here based on instinct? Or do I want to take the time to be analytical around the content that's being presented? In order to kind of drive this behavior home, I started to keep a mini scorecard and adapted from Agile. After my own meetings, I would go think about what happened in that meeting. Um, did I behave correctly? Did I behave in the way that I wanted to behave in that meeting? Um, and then why, why not? Um, and by doing those retrospectives, I can then think back to, okay, when this person said that, maybe I had some emotion that triggered an immediate response. Uh, and now that I have time to reflect on that meeting, I realize that maybe that emotion masked my ability to understand what was being presented and to be objective about learning and helping advance the organization. Over time, um, what I found is I was able, just, just starting by simply labeling kind of, was it a fast or slow, uh, instinct, and then reflecting on that, I was able to make the transition to spend more time on what I declared, what I wanted, which was slow decision making. I wanted to be analytical. I didn't want the emotion to cloud the decisions. I wanted to, when I was meeting or discussing with people, I wanted to be able to share and learn and further what we were doing together. But that required kind of moving um, to an analytical uh, way of thinking. So I think that was um, kind of on, on the personal side, kind of a very, very uh, concrete, easy thing to do that I think has kind of helped move the needle in the direction of analytical. And to be tr transparent, I continue to do that today. Uh, it's never perfect. We are humans. We have emotions. Uh, emotions are natural. Uh, we have instincts. Instincts are natural. But being able to identify that and tease that apart from, is that actually how we're going to make a decision, I think is really, really important. Um, second, you know, what I found kind of interesting with teams is we can do the same thing with our teams. Um, and I think with teams, it really follows the same journey. There's this first step to say, uh, let's understand a bit more about how the brain works, how our minds work. It was introduced this concept of thinking fast, thinking slow, or instinct and analytics. Um, and ask for feedback. So going into team meetings, let's, give, let's ask if our teams for permission if we can start to identify whether or not we're responding fast or we're responding slow, um, ask for permission on whether or not we're, we can provide feedback on uh, kind of how we interact together. And so if we're in a meeting together and you catch me reacting with my fast brain, you know, maybe there's a code word, hey, Mike, that's fast, let's go slow, which is enough to kind of just say, let's pause, you're right, okay, let's get back to the substance of what we're talking about and focus on the analysis and the depth of uh, whatever we're trying to do to improve the organization. That's really helpful to know. Um, so do you have um, a particular instance where you realize in a moment that you are using your fast brain and try to make a, a reaction and you call that and make a correction? Uh, and that can be a really interesting thing to forward audience to hear and, uh, and try to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I find the people I work with are quite responsive. You know, quick, oh, I'm sorry, I, uh, you know, um, I reacted too quickly. Tell me more about what you really mean. Um, I find like I've been forgiven pretty readily at, uh, when, when we've identified that kind of the, the response is instinctual as opposed to deep. Um, and I find that a really, really easy thing to do. Um, and, uh, and knowing that, you know, if we can put that conversation in, then, the con then really if you think about what's really happening is I'm saying, I'd really like to understand better what you're thinking about. Uh, what are you seeing? Can we work on that together? And that is a very, very collaborative uh, framework for working together as a team. And we'll touch on other concepts as we, as we go through, um, but it kind of leads to, you know, um, how we work productively together, how we ensure that um, different people on the team, regardless of backgrounds, 
have the opportunity to participate, to share, to enrich, to enrich the conversation. And if we do those things, then we'll be better able to make a good decision on how we proceed. And importantly, we will have done it together, where we will feel that we've all contributed to the conversation and can move forward together, uh, which I think also uh, kind of broadly makes it more likely uh, that we'll be successful in um, executing what we think is right. What I hear is, um, so by simply just having an awareness of, of thinking fast and slow, and, uh, and also we can start of labeling that during meetings or uh, one-on-one conversation, and they have a, something like common language to uh, call people out that this is this is not analytical. This is a fast. Uh, this is a fast brain working. So uh, we can sort of table that or uh, catch that, and then have a more uh, in-depth conversation, um, setting aside the uh, potential emotion, and, and continue with the conversation. Is that the right interpretation of that? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as an engineer, I, I think about it pretty simply. I'm engaging in a conversation and I'm listening. And in parallel, uh, for every interaction, I'm going to determine, was that fast or slow? That simple. And then at the end of the meeting, I'll think about how many of my reactions were fast and was I able to convert that to slow uh, or not? Uh, and that's really what I, I, I wanted to do personally. It's like, let's move that conversation from instinct to analysis. But to do that, we start by just identifying where are we reacting instinctively? Turns out, I think it's relatively straightforward to do that. We can just choose to do that. So let's do it. Uh, and then separately, kind of once we're measuring it, we can start to shift uh, more of our thinking to analytical. Yeah, I can see how effective a, a bill, um, this principle can help to manage emotion um in uh at work in meetings i remember you mentioned a really good example of how you use this technique during uh right now like covid19 uh, people are working from home so and potentially a lot of people may be stressed and meanwhile they have to they, they have work to do so how do you um do you mind bring up that example and what's the practice you're applying to uh to the team yeah i think for a lot of companies the current environment has um, introduce a lot of change in a very short period of time. Uh, a lot of companies that don't have uh, practices around remote work, for example, are now working remotely, and that happened overnight. Um, and I think it's a, it's a big, big change, um, I, I think, across a number of dimensions. Um, and we like to think about it in terms of two broad categories. Like There's a category of things that are now easier, uh, given how we work, and there's a category of things that are harder. Um, I think on the easier side, um, I think for a lot of people, it's easier to have short five-minute conversations. You don't have to schedule a meeting. You don't have to walk around. You don't need to book a meeting room, which is probably unavailable. You can just Slack or email and jump on a quick Zoom. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity now to have more frequent, shorter conversations with each other. Um, there was a, a really interesting talk by um, Kellen from Etsy, uh, around kind of uh, teamwork, and he had a quote which was, the half-life of truth is six weeks. Uh, and kind of the conclusion of that is that every six weeks for the people we work with closely, let's touch base and just check in to see how people are feeling. I think some things are a lot harder. Um, a lot of communication is nonverbal, and nonverbal communication is a lot harder to pick up on a screen like we have today. Um, and that means that subtle cues that we would have picked up on when we were together in person, we're not going to see and we're not going to feel. Um, I think there's um, an example of a practice that we've put in place at Flow um, designed around this. Um, it's really this idea that when we get together as a group um, and in our company, we do this weekly, once a week on Monday morning, we have a company-wide standup. Um, we've had that practice for quite a long time. Um, at the end of the stand-up, we um, close with allowing everybody in the company to share how they're feeling. And it really is focused on how are you feeling going into this week? Um, and it gives a glimpse to other people at how everybody that we work with and depend on is doing going into the week. As COVID um, rolled out for our company and we went to full remote, um, 
my partner had an idea to extend that and share a bit more rather than just the feeling, just share with the company some thoughts and how are you feeling? How are things going for you uh, in this environment? And it was an incredibly powerful moment in our, in our business. Um, we went person by person on a Zoom call like this and everybody shared how they were feeling. Um, I'm feeling anxious uh, because of X. I'm really struggling because I have two young children at home and my wife is a healthcare professional and I'm finding it hard to have the time to focus on what I need to do while balancing schoolwork in the home. Um, I'm feeling quite um, comfortable and getting used to the new way of working. Um, at the end of kind of that session, um, it was really interesting to get some feedback from the teams. And my favorite comment from one of our team members was uh, he shared, I didn't know how much I needed to hear that how everybody else is doing until I heard it. Um, just an incredibly powerful moment. Yeah, I can also diffuse a lot of emotions and, uh, and also be able to bond, like we're all going through the same thing. Um, and how do you see people behave afterwards, after having that emotional check-in? You know, it's a, um, what, what, what was, you know, kind of magical about it is first we can just talk about emotion as first class. Uh, and I think in a lot of places it just doesn't happen. We're just assumed to be emotionally neutral and positive and being able to focus on the work at hand. Uh, but this is a lot of change. And so let's just, let's just talk about emotion. There's no reason to not to, we're all human. Um, what happens is when you hear your colleague say something either fun it makes you smile, or maybe you hear a colleague is, uh, has a challenge. Um, now all of a sudden you have the ability to reach out and say, you know, I heard you say this on Monday. I wanted to see if there's anything I can do to help. Uh, and in many cases, there's a lot we can do to help. Uh, in this environment, we've, had, um, uh, we've been able to restructure people's schedules, for example, so that they can split their day so they can accommodate their partner also working while juggling childcare in a small home. Um, those sorts of things, they may seem small, but now all of a sudden we have a schedule for an individual who can contribute uh, to work because this person cares deeply about their work uh, while also supporting their family. And that is a, a big, big change in the quality of their day-to-day -day life. Um, and we wouldn't have known that if we didn't have this structure in place to talk about um, the challenges that people are feeling. Yeah. And it's uh, incredibly convenient. You mentioned just do that at any meeting. It takes about, you know, a, a, maybe 30 seconds or less to for everyone to go through and provide the update on emotion. And then uh, and that just achieves a lot of um, really good effects. Um, so we can talk a little bit. Um, so you also mentioned a principle uh, in our early conversation about incentives. And, um, uh, and also remember that you cited a very interesting practice that you applied in your company about um, not having QA environments and not having staging environments and, uh, and only do testing on production. That's, uh, that's bizarre, but um, it's effective. So can you tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the principles around incentives that affect people's behavior? And, and then also, of course, dive deep into that specific example of not having testing environments. Um, yeah, great. We love, love that aspect of our business. I think to start, um, to paint a broad picture, I feel like there's two ways to run an organization. There's the military style, which is you have very strict rules and very severe consequences for not following the rules, and you drill that into the culture repeatedly and make a huge investment. Um, and then I feel like there is the, the opposite end of the spectrum, which is we accept that humans have shortcomings and we design our organizations, our culture, and our process uh, to understand what our own shortcomings are. Um, and I think the, I think both models can work. I think the danger is when we pretend to be in one model but are actually in the other. Um, and as an example of that, I think many of us like to define a process and then just assume the process will be followed and are surprised when it isn't. Um, and thinking about that, my own perspective is let's really understand how people work as humans and understand kind of where our limitations are um, and design for that. And as a specific example, uh, most of the people I speak with these days will tell you that um, automated tests are an important part of software development. Um, I imagine almost everyone on this call would agree with that statement. Um, but then you ask the follow-on question, well, if they're important, then what is the quality of our test coverage? Um, 
what is the quality of our test code? Is it treated as first class code as feature development or is it an afterthought? And in most of the places um, I've been, we have seen a wide variety of quality of testing. Usually there's a lack of test coverage. Still today, I see many organizations and people that just don't write tests at all, no automated tests, don't believe in the value of it. Uh, largely will tell you time to market is more important. I don't have time for tests. Let me focus on getting a feature out and then we'll add test, tests later. Um, and believe that's the right thing to do. Um, as we dug into this, we started to ask questions um, and um, as kind of my past organization at Guilt as we were scaling, you start to, you start to really under, try to understand why is it that if we all agree that tests are important, the quality of our test coverage isn't better. Uh, and so we start to you know, peel the onion. Why aren't we writing a test? I don't need to, uh, writing a test is too hard. Um, uh, well, what are you doing instead of testing? Well, we have a QA group that will manually test my chain, so I'm gonna let them do it rather than do the hard work to figure out how to write an automated test. Um, or you find that there's a process limitation. It's I'm responsible for writing features and meeting requirements. Somebody else is responsible for verifying the quality. It's not my job. Um, and if you keep asking those questions, where kind of uh, where the road eventually led, um, I felt was this question of what are the true incentives of the different people in our organization, um, and do we like those incentives? And uh, one of the things we did is we changed the accountability, like who is accountable for writing automated tests and who is accountable for the quality of the software. We made an explicit decision to change that and make it the engineer's responsibility. Um, and now the engineer is accountable for the quality of their work that keeps the locus of control with the engineer. And that meant, um, you know, it sounded good, but yet still quality of test automation, not high enough, coverage not high enough. We're still depending on separate organizations to verify uh, defects. The cycle time is slow from creation of feature to bug that uh, we went further. We said, okay, let's pull everything away. You will have no other way to guarantee that your software is correct other than writing an automated test. That's it. We're going to take everything away. No QA departments, no manual review, no user acceptance testing, uh, no QA environments, no staging environments. At Flowey, we even went further. You can't even run, nobody even runs their software on their laptop anymore uh, because that's not an automated test. You just write the automated test. And what ends up happening is you get it down to the bare bones. And as an engineer, you can deploy code and hope it works, or you can write an automated test and guarantee it works. And that is the only decision that you get to make. And as engineers, we don't want defects. And so we're forced to write automated tests. As a result, the automated test coverage goes way up. The test quality goes way up. And as a business, we get what the business values, which is leverage over time to make sure that we can keep delivering new features, new software quickly at a high level of quality, uh, which is an incredibly difficult thing to maintain over a long period of time. Is other engineers sort of addicted to this after they get used to it? Or... Um because I feel like there's still have a lot of freedom and less work and potentially more exciting way to get code deployed. So how's the, I want to know um, what's people's reaction when you first introduced this to the team and, uh, and how they like it now after, you know, sort of using that for a while. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, as engineers, I think we value creating software that's used by other people. Um, and what can we do to reduce the friction to getting our software out? Uh, I think is an important incentive as well. Uh, at Flow, we practice continuous delivery, which means merge your PR. It's on its way to production automatically. It will be deployed. You're not thinking about deploys. You're not thinking about anything else related. All you're thinking about is build my pull requests, write my automated test, test pass, merge. It's in production. Uh, and that, as an engineer, is pretty exciting. As new people enter the organization, uh, it's a different way of working. Um, and, you know, we'll sometimes get questions of, like, you know, I'm trying to run this thing locally so I can inspect the output of my API or whatever. And the organization can't help because we don't know how to do that. Uh, we know how to write automated tests and we're really good at that. And so it ends up being back to whatever you think you can inspect uh, visually in your API, rather than inspect it visually, write the automated test that's going to do whatever you're going to do when you look at it. Uh, that's where kind of the leverage is at Flow. And usually when we talk about these things, uh, there are categories of software where we don't do this. So the UIs that have visual elements, um, we practice continuous delivery, but to dark canaries and then promote from there. So we include a human uh, review cycle kind of where it's necessary or frankly cost efficient to do it. 
but for all of the things that we can test programmatically, the culture is tested programmatically and remove all the other ways of doing it so that we're encouraged to uh, improve the way that we test our software and invest in that approach uh, rather than fragmenting our effort across uh, other models of testing. Is all of this practice is driven by the understanding how incentives can play a big role in directing people's behavior? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really, is, really, really is important. And I think it's the real incentives. Let's have the maturity to understand what are the actual incentives that our team members have, not the ones that we say we want, but with the ones that people actually feel our, our culture and our company rewards. Uh, identify those. If they're the right ones, great. If not, uh, that's a really, really powerful opportunity as a leader to go in and review the incentives and s look at changing those incentives to produce a different outcome. Yep. Um, I remember you mentioned there's a, a third principle that apply at work. Uh, it's mainly uh, relevant to uh, really to uh, empathy. Um, can you share more on that and uh, and maybe we can go through some examples? Yeah, we, we speak a lot as we think about behavioral psychology and how the mind works and we're talking about emotions. Uh, there's, there's a broad term around empathy or emotional intelligence that I think is another interesting area of research. Um, and there it's really about learning how we can um, understand um, how other people are feeling. And if we could do that, then we can engage in a deeper conversation or a deeper level of understanding kind of with, the, with, with that person. Um, I think it's a really important piece because when we, when we do that, we will find that we are more excited to work together. We're more productive working together because we will feel uh, like a team will have trust. And on the back of that trust, we can drive productivity. Uh, so I think it's a really, really powerful tool. I think maybe it's just two examples of kind of how we might leverage uh, empathy. Uh, recently, um, I had a conversation with uh, one of our clients. Um, and uh, the conversation, there was a moment where it was emotional. Um, and uh, after I uh, had a follow-up call one-on-one -on -one, um, with, uh, with, my, with, with my client in this case, uh, and it was a fantastic call. Um, she shared, uh, I'd like to give you some feedback on how, that, how our last meeting went. Uh, I listened, I took detailed notes. She had kind of eight different areas of improvement. Uh, once she was done sharing her feedback, I asked permission to... Uh, replay what I heard her say and share my perspective. Uh, because I had kept detailed notes, I could respond on all eight points that she had raised, which demonstrated to her very clearly, I am listening. Uh, I'm actively, actively listening to what you're saying. I'm not paying lip service. Um, once I had shared back kind of direct feedback on her comments, I then shared kind of my perspective in the same way. Uh, when you, you said this, uh, here's what was going on with my team and here's how that made our team feel which meant that um, you know, the, the challenge is our team feels like they did a lot of work that's underappreciated and it's demotivating. Um, that was kind of our perspective. And then once we had aligned on kind of sharing a common set of uh, how the meeting went and how we each perceived kind of the impact on each other, it was really easy to then transition to next steps. Great, here's what we're going to do moving forward. Uh, we can do a better job of you know, being clear on commitments or, or decisions or uh, when we need input from your team um, and we took those learnings and we incorporated them into our process and kind of just and just moved on. And rather than that being kind of a big deal, it's now part of our standard process. We're working better together. The teams are feeling better. We're delivering higher value for our clients, uh, and we're focused on productive work. Um, but again, to do that, I think the kind of that deep empathy and and really making the decision that you're going to be interested in the other person's perspective, and then doing the hard work of listening and proving to them that yes, I care about you a lot. Uh, and I am going to work with you and things that are important to you, I am going to iterate and improve on together with your support is a really, really important part to making a relationship work. And then finally, I think there's a really interesting, um, uh, there's another book in the field called Stumbling to Happiness. And, and it has a very deep insight um, that I've been thinking a lot about uh, lately, but, but it comes down to what makes people happy. And the book has lots of research that says, our happiness depends on how happy we think we will be and nothing to do with how happy we are in the moment. Um, and it's, just, it's a profound statement. Um, and, and I've been thinking about how we, you know, how do we apply that in the workplace? Um, we can generate more excitement by thinking about 
you know, how we describe where, as a, where we will be as a team in six months' time and making sure that everyone is excited and happy about that destination, that actually, if you believe the book, is more important than what it feels like day to day to get there. It just doesn't matter. We can anchor our goal as uh, almost, uh, what's the word, this perfect place, the unicorn place. And as long as we do that with excitement, uh, then we'll sludge through whatever it takes to get there. And our memory of our experience will be what we thought it was, and we won't remember the day to day. Mike, I think that's an absolutely impactful insight. I, I was hoping we could dive into, there was an example shared with us ahead of time by one of our community members looking to solve a specific challenge in their team where they have a couple different ICs that how they described them was like the, the people that are sort of geniuses that do incredible work, but maybe don't necessarily play well with, with others. Um, can you share a little bit about how like something like this concept of stumbling for happiness can help those people that are disengaged or maybe don't necessarily play well with other people on the team and how you could leverage this to, to motivate them or inspire them to, to continue to move forward with the, the goals of the organization. Could you touch on a little bit like that specific case study? Um, absolutely. So, uh, you know, in these cases, I think just a few general observations. Um, one is where we have these strong ICs that don't play well within an organization. If you go, most of the organizations in that situation regret not solving the problem sooner. Um, and that's very, very consistent in hindsight. We should have addressed this problem sooner. And then when you dig into why, um, I think the, the basic premise is if you're an IC that's part of an organization, that organization is going to produce something bigger than what any one of us individually can do. Uh, and I think, that, I think that's the, the most important takeaway is that. Um, and if you believe it, if you really believe that, that we as a team, as a company, are gonna produce something larger than any one of us individually can do, then the emphasis has to be on making sure that we're working well together because we're not after, because we want that greater whole. Um, strategies to get there. Um, I think we come back a lot of what behavioral psychology is, is understanding kind of how we uh, actually work as humans, our emotions, our brains, our decision making. And I think we can, it, one approach is to kind of level set on, you know, what we're going to invest in. We're all going to go read Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. We're going to get some coaching in on uh, emotional intelligence, uh, but we're going to introduce these concepts as new skills that we can all acquire so that we can remain individually productive while supporting the rest of the team. Uh, that's kind of one approach to kind of teasing this apart. Um, others that I've seen is um, at the end of the day, uh, what's a concrete example? There's an R&D driven company where the R&D department produces models that are then uh, brought into production by an API team. Uh, there's always friction. You know, if only the model was written a different way, then it'd be so much easier to consume and from the business perspective, there's always the question, why does it take so long to get our new models into production? Um, what breaks that down is breaking down the organizational barrier and getting those teams to just work together or, or share together. Here's what's really good for us. Here are what the challenges are. Create that dialogue, base it in trust, identify when the response is you know, fast, move it back to slow uh, so that the teams can understand the context and then use that as then the catalyst to uh, break down those, I think, what's being described as a barrier to other teams contributing. Thank you, Mike. Um, so we're transitioning now to the Q and a, I have a, a question for you from James McGraw. And so the, the question is what is the panel's thoughts around when to ask an expert to think slow? And so um, do you have any, any thoughts about when to have that conversation? Um, yeah, and I think James referenced uh, Blink, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, very, very entertaining book. Um, if you like that line, if you like those books, please go read Thinking Fast and Slow. What's remarkable about Kahneman's work is um, he describes the experiments uh, with uh, real rigor that support kind of the conclusions that they're drawing. Uh, and the book I found is written in a really friendly style where they present the experiment and they ask you to make a judgment. Uh, you turn the page. 80% of the time, they accurately described the judgment that I made and then went on to tell me why I was wrong. Um, so a fascinating book, and it sheds light on the research that's happening that then informs books like uh, Gladwell's work. Uh, so we'll give you kind of a deep lens into that. 
Um, I think the specific question of kind of, you know, the instinct versus non-instinct, um, I don't think anything is 100%. Um, I, I, what I found quite interesting is if we can identify is it an instinctive response or not, um, then we can just decide if we want to make an instinctual decision or not. Uh, and I used, uh, personally like to use the word intentionality a lot. Let's be intentional about that. Um, um, and then use that to guide. Um, so I, again, I don't think it's black or white, but I, I think it's important to recognize which way we're thinking so that we have a chance of then deciding if we think that's the right way, if that's the best way or not, the most optimal way or not. Um, and then I think maybe just to put in context, um, as you know, we use the word expertise, where are we really expert? Um, most of us, I would say, as we gain expertise, we realize how far we are from actually being expert. Um, and maybe there's a conclusion where there's a very small scope where each of us individually has true expertise. I don't think it's a wide scope, um, but then identify that. And if you can identify that proactively, this is definitely in my field of expertise. Boom, I'm trusting my instinct, great. But let's be kind of honest with ourselves about the breadth of information and knowledge uh, that we don't understand. Uh, and I think within engineering, that is definitely true because we have heterogeneous technologies. We have products that span heterogeneous areas. Uh, I personally find that my any expertise that I would claim to have is very, very narrow in scope, where the majority of my day should be analytical. That's fantastic. That reminds me of, I don't know if you've seen the Neil deGrasse Masterclass, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson Masterclass advertisement where he talks about most people know just enough to realize that they are, they think they're smarter than they are. They think they know enough information to make a decision when in fact they don't. Yeah. Um, I think it's really funny. So a follow-up question for this, there's been a couple people, Corey and Victor both asked a similar question about, are there situations where using the fast brain is more effective? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I don't, um, you know, where my thinking went on this is uh, ESPN has the whole Chicago Bulls documentary series going right now, and uh, Michael Jordan um, hitting the game-winning jumper, you know, at the end of a game probably falls into the camp of instincts instinctively better than him thinking about what he's going to do. Um, and I kind of picked that as like an example of when. Like that level of expertise that's really narrow, uh, maybe there's evidence that the, ins the instinctive decision is better there. Um, I think uh, beyond that, um, uh, what I would do is just kind of phrase the question, how would we answer that, that question in our, in our own organization? Um, and I think that's a relatively easy thing to do in hindsight. Uh, so if you just keep track of how you're making these decisions, um, write them down three months from now, six months from now, review your log, look at the decisions that you made and whether they were fast or slow and rate yourself. Like, would you make that same decision now and knowing what you know, uh, within a short period of time, you will calibrate yourself and decide which way of thinking is working better for you and your business. And if you like that technique, um, it comes from Drucker's books on, uh, effective man management. And one of, uh, uh, my favorite things in that, that book that he says you should do is decide for the next quarter, where do I think I should be investing my time? Is it on uh, growth of my engineering teams? Is it on recruiting? Is it on strategy? Is it on execution? Whatever it is, write it down. I'm going to spend 60% of my time on recruiting. For a week, write down in 15-minute blocks where you actually spent your time. At the end of the week, review that vis-a-vis -vis what you said you were going to do, uh, and that will inform if you're actually spending your time how you said you were and will allow you to then to make adjustments on, you know, if recruiting is really important right now, and you're only spending 20% where you said you wanted to spend 60, what changes do you need to make so that you can actually be spending your time where you think it's most effective? And I think that same technique here will work. There's no magic bullet, but we can do it intentionally. We can record it. And with hindsight, we can evaluate if we as individuals are making decisions better under the fast or the slow system. Wonderful. To go back to some of the insights that you shared about working with different team members, do you have any general tips related to behavioral psychology for how to, how to understand the different individual motivations or how to cater to your team's purpose to those different motivations? Do you, I guess do you know how to figure out what motivates people and how do you change your behavior or what you're doing to, to impact that? Yeah, you know, a couple of thoughts there. Um, people, uh, there's this term of kind of knowledge workers or thought workers. Um, where kind of a lot, a lot of what we do is intellectual, and I think a lot of engineering falls into that camp. 
um, one way um, I've been thinking about that recently is what that means is that if we're going to work together, we have to have our brains connect. Like what's you, you have to understand what's in my brain. I have to understand what's in your brain uh, in order to get that common alignment. Uh, and it actually takes time to be able to communicate with one-on-one uh, -on -one or in small groups to get to the point where we feel like uh, my perspective has been heard and understood and vice versa. Um, so I think it, it just, it genuinely takes time, but I think it's kind of that important step to ensuring that kind of we're all, uh, we are all aligned and heard so that we can then recommit to the path forward. Um, there's one specific uh, practice we do at Flow, uh, which is we put our emotions in a box uh, and we literally use that term. Um, and what that means is we'll go into a discussion around let's, what's the best way forward for whatever the ask is. Um, and we're going to go through a process where we're going to enumerate all of the options, no matter how unpalatable. And for each, we're going to go through an exercise of identifying the pros and the cons of how we approach that. And then at the end, we're going to make a decision objectively on what's best for our organization. Once we've made that decision, we're going to go take that box of emotions back and we're going to reopen it and we're going to address the emotion. Even though I think we agreed option four is the best, for me, that's a really difficult decision because I just spent 18 months working on something that's now going to get decommissioned as a result of the decision. Or I really don't like the approach because personally I was interested in learning some new technology and this path doesn't allow us to introduce new technology. And I'm struggling with that kind of mismatch between what I think is right for the organization and what I think is right for myself. Um, what I love about that approach is that we get to we get to separate those two decisions, right? Let's make an analytical decision for what's right for the business, enumerating all the options, getting out all the fears and the anxiety into the, the open, make the best decision, and then with the same intensity, let's go tackle the emotional element uh, to make sure that we can move forward. I think that is such a fascinating process because it reminds me of some of the challenges that, that Jerry and I have navigated together and the times where we've been able to be most effective with that is when Jerry sort of helped facilitate. I think this happened after you and him had a conversation, helped separate the emotion of the decision from the objective an analysis of it. And it had a huge transformation on our ability to reason through what was going to be the most effective decision for that. So thank you for introducing him to that that and impacting impacting our, our behavior together. That was really exciting. Um, so another uh, follow-up question from, from Christopher, how does multitasking, especially the kind of in-meeting multitasking that happens in a lot of large groups, so like people, the slacking while there's a conversation um, or like the multiple conversations happening at once, uh, how does that affect the fast and slow thinking responses? Uh, it sounds like a question around meeting hygiene. So let's tackle meeting <laughs> hygiene first. Uh, just don't do it. Um, culturally, we decided at Flow that we're not gonna do it. You're in a meeting. Uh, no phones, no laptops. Um, are we 100% compliant? No, back to really understanding how people work. Uh, but that's the question, and that's that for leadership. Uh, my suggestion is to really think about that. If you're going to have a meeting and you need those people there, they should be participating. If they're not participating, then you don't need the meeting. And, and I think that approach solves much of this problem. Um, I'm a single-threaded or multi-threaded. Um, uh, I've come... My, my current thinking is that we're much more all single threaded. I think humans are single threaded. I think we can switch threads relatively quickly and that's a skill, uh, but generally we can focus on one thing. Uh, back to the gorillas at the beginning, we focus on one thing. Uh, and I think that's a really, really important um, observation. And if we then apply it back to a meeting hygiene, um, like let's get together to make a decision or to, to discuss something. The purpose of the meeting is clear. When things come up that are orthogonal, uh, table them. That's a really interesting point. Let's table that so that we can address kind of what, we're, what we really need to focus on. Um, and when all else fails, because this is, I think, a really hard thing in practice, um, one of the, uh, maybe related to COVID, um, I think in this environment, maybe we learn a bit from Amazon and Amazon style of requiring a document that is thorough to be shared before the meeting that clearly outlines the work done to date and the parameters around what we want to discuss. Um, that could be a really good approach in this environment that rather than having a long brainstorming session, have a smaller group put together a proposal or a request for comment uh, in advance of the meeting so that when we get to the meeting, the time is more structured on the specific uh, pain point that we need to discuss. Great. So this is more of a, a question on implementation. So 
say if, if this is from, from Jason, Jason shares, like, how would you deal with a, a boss that maybe disagrees prefer, for his different methods? So say somebody wanted to walk away from this conversation and apply some of the behavioral psychology uh, concepts that we've been talking about, but they're facing resistance, disagreement, and maybe preferences to alternative structures. Um, what would be your approach there? How would you, how would you support that person? Yeah, it's, uh, you, you know, I think broadly, uh, in our, in a corporate hierarchy, your boss is your boss, um, and delivering what the organization needs is important. Um, uh, and I think that should just be taken into account, um, in terms of kind of how you manage that relationship. Um, you know, if the half-life of truth is six weeks, then make sure there's frequent communication, um, there, depending on the culture of the company, there may be a culture of disagree and commit, which means we're free to argue and debate. But at the end of the day, once we make a decision, and it may not be your decision, uh, the company culture is aligned. Um, if the culture is not um, uh, explicit, then I think the first step is a conversation around, would like to try to codify what our culture is around making decisions so that I understand what you boss expect of me. Uh, would be like a good starting point. And then once you really kind of have that framework, then um, then I think it's just executing it. Um, when we go through like a, a decision-making process, let's say, and you have a disagreement with your boss, um, it's actually really easy to say, you know, I know that this is ultimately your decision, um, but would like your help to go through the different options and at least make sure that you understand what my reservations are on the assumption that I think you're going to make a decision without appreciating all of the ramifications. Um, and then that's the structure. And it, if it's your boss's decisions, their decision, let's try to make it informed. Let's make sure that uh, we have an opportunity to be heard. And if at the end of the day, your boss leaves no room for empathy, then it's a personal choice if that's the right culture for you. Um, and in thinking about that, think about how your teams feel about you. Um, and think about if you don't engage in that same level of empathy, ultimately they may try but ultimately it leads to this question of I've worked really, really hard uh, to do the right thing for the business in a way that kind of meets uh, my desire to have my input heard. Um, we'd like to make, I'd like my companies and want to speak on behalf of you, but I love in my companies that we feel like our people are contributing ideas to help us make good decisions because then it allows them to buy into the decision that we're making, even in the instances where the decision may be against what a personal preference is. Looks like we have a lot of questions about the um, automated testing on production. And um, so can you share a little bit more on um, uh, how the decision is made um, and, uh, and what kind of automated testing framework or tools you, uh, you recommend people to use? And then um, there's another question about um, how does it involve, how do you involve like, product people into the place, verifying the features is working as expected, uh, meeting customers' need. Instead of just engineering, making sure their code works as expected, but more on the requirement and, and, and design. Um, great questions. Um, we, uh, at Flow, we gave two talks over the last couple of years at QCon New York. Uh, the first was called Testing and Production. In, uh, I believe we gave that in 17 or 18. 18. And last year, we gave a talk called Design Microservice Architectures the Right Way. Uh, and both of those talks go into much more depth in terms of uh, the, the pros and cons, the business case, and how we actually execute uh, on those. On um, testing in production, you know, this, this was one of those observations that most of the people I know do this anyway. And in fact, the engineers that had the biggest influence in my own development were all doing this obsessively. Um, and so let's take, just because it's taboo, doesn't matter, people are doing it, let's call it for what it is, uh, and let's make verification in production or testing in production one of our practices. Why is it so important? Because it's the target environment. Uh, we have other tools like launching features darkly, um, and ultimately, the minute a change goes to production, if you build a culture of going into production and verifying that it's behaving as it is, you will find that quality will increase, and time to detection of a error will decrease. You'll know. Um, so culturally, we felt that this was a really, really important practice. And that's the framework under which if you wanted to make this business case for your own company, uh, that I would re recommend thinking about it. It is not a substitute for automated testing. 
if you have a QA environment, it's not a substitute for that. Uh, but in addition, it is another tool that we could add into our quality program to make sure that the software that we're delivering is acting as intended, uh, even through to the final stage where it's in production and available for user or customer use. And how do you convince, um, in your case, you're the CTO, so uh, you had authority and had a lot of influence to make that decision transition to production-only testing uh, methodology. But um, if you are not on that position, and uh, how do you, uh, what kind of recommendation you have for people to convince and make a case for it? Because there are a lot of risks involved, especially for people who've never done it before. Uh, right. Um, you know, I think... When uh, at Gilt, when we looked at our uh, technology budget, about 30 to 40 percent of the cost was going into maintaining our staging environments and our QA environments and that side of the, uh, the that side of the coin. Almost half our tech budget was spent just trying to get stuff tested in QA, um, and that's really interesting. Um, and then when you dig into it further, it turns out that the things that were hardest to test in our staging environments were all the UIs because they depended on so many services. Um, so that's interesting because we're pretty, it's pretty safe to roll out a canary of a new UI. Um, that's not gonna, the probability that that's gonna negatively harm production is almost zero. Great, so let's, instead of trying to build staging environments and spending a fortune maintaining these environments so we can test UI, let's get rid of that entire wasted process and start testing UIs in production and invest in canaries. Great. Our QA process continues, but now our UIs are being tested in production. We don't have to worry about the cost of maintaining the environment. It just works. And separately, we can then put traffic on that UI, uh, which is when it really goes into effect, if you will, for our customers. Um, so if you kind of follow that thinking, the ROI on this is quite high because you're taking an investment that is really probably not very effective and you're shifting it so that you can spend more time building features um, at the same or higher level of quality. Um, that's really kind of the way that I would approach the business case. And then you start cascading it. Um, with microservices, depending on your architecture, many of those services, you can have very, very high confidence in the quality based on the automated test suites. In those cases, there's a really good candidate to say, we're getting no value from our uh, QA environment. We would be much better with a different deployment strategy. Uh, but I think that that has to be that conversation and it comes back to, you know, what is most important to the organization. If you're in an organization that says we can never have a defect, um, then you're going to design your program around that. If you're in an organization that values efficient delivery of soft quality software, then you're already kind of in that trade-off camp, right? And, uh, and, and I think those are your levers, right? You can invest more in feature develop uh, productivity. You can save money on staging environments and invest that in better automated testing will that result ultimately in higher quality or not? Uh, that should be the analysis, but that is the goal. With finite resources, how can we invest them to improve the overall quality and efficiency with which we do deliver features? Mike, thank you so much. That is all the time we have for Q&A. I just wanted to say thank you again so much for, for spending your time with us and, and sharing your ideas and sharing so many great stories of how you've applied this to, to make a difference in your organization. But just wanted to, to end, you know, many of us are, are facing important decisions and dealing with real human challenges right now. And Mike shared uh, so many different concepts from behavioral psychology, fast and slow decision making, stumbling to happiness, designing incentives based on actual human behavior that can help you make better decisions and be a better leader for your teams. We hope that as you walk away, you're better able to navigate the different leadership environment you're in just a little bit better and that you make better decisions and lock performance in your teams. So thank you all so much for, for choosing to spend your time with us. And Mike, thank you again so much for, for joining us and, and sharing your time and sharing your insights. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Mike.